I forgot to uh, hand out the 44 prophecies last week, so if you want a copy of that, I made the copies. I just forgot to pass them out, so if you want to, after class, stop and get them so, we don't, so I don't feel like I wasted all the paper. Um, and also, I have notes for tonight. I wonder who I can get to. Can you pass them out? Just mine. Just yours? Thank you. <laughs> that woke him up. He said he was sleepy before class, so that woke him up. So um, I wanted to mention a couple things as we move uh, forward. Uh, I wanted to clarify a little bit of stuff. So I want everybody to understand that in this class that we all know that the Bible stands alone in defending itself. Okay, we, we all understand that. The Bible is our standard for truth, being that it's God's word to guide us through uh, this life and lead us to eternal salvation. So we know even though we're going through all of these um, proofs of the validity of the scriptures, we know that the Bible stands alone in defending itself. We don't need anything. It's, it's all truth. Um, we as defenders of our faith only needed to provide explanations to people, to those that bring forth accusations that the scripture's not true or if there's anything that's said that's, um, that they say it is a discrepancy. We don't have to provide anything but an explanation because there's only, that's the only truth that we have. They can only give you explanations for their uh, beliefs also. So I want everybody to keep that in mind. So they can't even defend their own beliefs, um, but we can give explanations. I just wanted to know if anybody had so far that we've gone, if anybody had any questions or any topics that um, they have come across regarding discrepancies in the Bible that I didn't mention or didn't cover that I would like to, I would like to look up. Dave? So went back to the famine and yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. So David pointed out that just recently in science, I'm not gonna try to repeat what that was, <laughs> but uh, that it went back to archeology span had found some evidence of the time of Joseph during the time of the famine after some of their diggings. Um, anything else, has anybody come across in conversations with people? Cause I, that's what this class is about. If I, if, we haven't talked about it, and if I don't have the answer, I'll, I'll, I will get it and uh, bring it up the next week. Okay, I just wanted to make that opportunity uh, for us. So, in everything that we've talked about so far, I'd like to know, too, how do you think society viewed the scriptures during the early church compared to how they are viewed today? Now, this is just an opinion based, but I want us to kind of think about that. How do you think the early church viewed uh, the scriptures. Now they didn't have um, the, the 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 Bible in whole, but they had the books, you know, separate books. But how do you think that they viewed that word of God? Do you think they viewed it the same as we view it today? I'm not moving on until you guys make comments. So, what do you think, Harold? Right. 
Carol's point was that um, with Darwin, now in our, kind of in our day, Darwinism, uh, that wasn't in effect back in the early church, so they really didn't even consider another option other than creation, perhaps. Tim? wanted to hear the word, didn't they? Yeah. Ned was saying that they, if they listened till midnight to uh, the preaching, they, they, wanted, they were interested in what was being said. But Tim had brought up the fact that they had probably had a lot of enemies as far as with the, the Romans and uh, the, the Jews wanted to stay to Judaism. Um, they, they would be fighting against Christianity, but he also pointed out that those people were uh, uh, looking to be um, against the word. So trying to destroy it. Yeah. yeah, they're trying to destroy it. Okay, so um, any, any other comments? Okay, so now I want what I mentioned last week, we we're going to, this came from uh, uh, clarifyingchristianity.com and some of the uh, concepts below are taken out of the Defender's st Study Bible, some of the ideas that we had. So uh, we're kind of going to get into some of the uh, science um, part of it and how the Bible compares to it. So the Bible is the only antiquity book that agrees with all modern day science. So think about that for a minute. So the Bible is the only ancient book that agrees with all modern day science. The Bible is not a science book, but it is scientifically accurate. So the Bible never claims to be a science book, but anytime it talks about science or mentions science, it's accurate. There's nothing, there's no mistakes regarding that. It is not known in this study of any scientific evidence that contradicts the Bible. There's no science out there today, even though that's all we're uh, bombarded with, is that, you know, the Bible's incorrect, it's got discrepancies, but there's not one scientific evidence that contradicts the Bible uh, today. And I find, that, I find that interesting. So we're going to go through some of these statements. And the first one, uh, the statements in the Bible that are consistent with paleontology. So turn over to Job 40. Hey, BK, could you put up the brontosaurus, please? Job chapter 40, starting in verse 15. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that this is talking about the brontosaurus, but I want us to read this, and it sounds like it's talking about the brontosaurus. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox, so we know that the brontosaurus eats vegetation. Um, See now, his strength is in his hips. It looks like where his strength's at. And his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. So here we have a description of, a, a, to me, it, it sounds like a dinosaur. So it's consistent with paleontology. Now go over to um, 41. And I, 
I was interested, I think, it, I don't know if it was in a lesson that Tim was given or in a class that we did in the back, but it actually, um, and I never really thought about it, but the Bible talks about dragons. And I actually read some articles, some scientific articles about fiery serpents. The scriptures talk about fiery serpents and science today is saying, well, those didn't really exist. Well, there's actually ancient writings that document fiery serpents. Um, they have also have inscriptions on stones in caves showing these uh, pictures of these type of animals. But I want us to read um, 41, starting in 41, verse 1. Now, this sounds like a, a Tyrannosaurus rex to me because it, um, you'll see here in a minute when it talks about the um, teeth and the scales. I did, did you guys know that Tyrannosaurus have scales? I didn't know. I thought dinosaurs were smooth skinned. They're, they're not. I looked them up. They have, they have scales. They had scales. What's that? Yeah. Well, not a bird. But, uh, well, similar, but they're not a bird. A bird's a bird and a dinosaur's a dinosaur. Trust me. <laughs> Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or a snare with his tongue with a line which you lo lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you leash him for your maidens? Will your companions make a banquet for him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. You'll never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, or his graceful proportions. Who can remove his outer coat? Who can approach him with double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near another that no air can come between them. So here we have a description of another large animal, dinosaur, beast. So we have scriptures that are consistent with paleontology. We also have uh, statements that are consistent with astronomy. Now, I, always, I, I encourage people to always listen to the opposite, uh, if you want to call it argument's sake, someone that's just against or opposed. Um, I listen to other people trying to figure out their opinion and where they're coming from. Now, I don't recommend uh, Joe Rogan because he has foul language uh, in his podcast. But I listened to Joe Rogan talking to a, a physicist whose name was Brian Cox. And I thought this was very interesting when I was listening to this. Brian Cox seemed like a decent uh, guy. He was uh, polite and he talked about Christianity in, in a manner of, he said, well, it's, it's an option. You know, he didn't discount. He said, we don't even know as scientists for sure how everything came about. But so he stated that creation by God or Christianity was a possibility. So this guy seemed like you could reason with him. Now, the reason he didn't believe the things um, that he was, that we believe in was because he could measure, he actually measured the universe. He could take measurements. He knows how the stars are a million light years or however far apart they are from the earth and he takes that as actual evidence so that's where he is coming from on his philosophy but however he's missing the one point that I made at the very beginning of class what can what how can we explain the stars being that far from How would you explain that to somebody if they said, well, that star's a billion light years from here? Thank you. God created. That, that eliminates everything. And we've already gone through, that's why I went through three weeks of proving the validity of the scriptures. It's because God created. And if God created, that lets us know that he made that star that far apart at the beginning. It was there. We just couldn't see it. 
So Brian Cox also discussed that he believed, now this is very interesting to me. He also discussed and said he believed because science can't prove creation or a beginning, he believed that the universe is eternal. And that, now why would you think that that's funny or odd? Why is that an odd statement if he says that the universe, he feels that the universe is eternal? Well, to me, it made me think because God's eternal. So he, can, he, he wants to think that the universe, something that is proven that is created, he wants to take that, that, well, since we can't explain the creation, it's eternal. Well, if he would look at it that the creator is eternal, that makes a lot more sense than saying that the universe is eternal. So I'm trying to figure out why he would accept an eternal universe and not an eternal God. So that's what we're dealing with. That those, that's how they think. And if we could get them to understand that it's a lot easier to understand that there is an eternal being that created all of these things. And science and evidence shows that these things are created. So going along back, because we're talking about astronomy, but I wanted to make that note because I listened to that uh, conversation and I thought it was just interesting some of the things that he, he was stating. So the Bible frequently refers to a great number of stars. So turn over to Genesis 22, 17. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies. Jeremiah 33, 22. Jeremiah 33, 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who ministered to me. So the sand being measured, they didn't have the ability back in that time to measure volume and all of those to come up with a, um, an amount of sand. And, they, and it also said that they uh, couldn't count the stars. They could just see the stars. And scientists today admit they still don't know exactly how many stars there are. And I think that that's interesting with all the telescopes that we have. The uh, estimates, and this article, and this article was just a couple years and it's already uh, dated because I found some uh, more recent notes this week. Estimates are uh, 10 to the 21st power and the number of grains of sands are, were 10 to the 25th power um, in this article, which 10 to the 21st power is a sextillion or a trillion. I have no idea. That's a, you know, a, a big number. And now they're saying today it's estimated that there are more stars in heaven than the grains of sand in the earth. And that, that's amazing to me. But we have scripture that said that back in Genesis. Bill? So Bill pointed out that back in that day, back in the time of Jeremiah, that they, the scientists of that day thought that there were probably about a thousand stars. And so now we see that back in Genesis and in Jeremiah, it says that they're numerous, they're, that you can't count them. And it's, it's true that we're finding today and all the technology that we have today, um, we still can't count them all. So today it's estimated by scientists that there's more stars in the heavens than the grains of the uh, sand and also the Bible states that each star is unique. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 
First Corinthians fifteen forty one. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So if, if you go out, and obviously you can tell that one star might be bigger than another star, but when you look out at the stars, they look like, what do they look like to you? With the naked eye. Little white dots. They all look, you would think that they're the same, you know, just, just one's bigger, one's smaller, same. Well, what do we know now with, with science? We know that that's not true. And here we have in 1 Corinthians is telling us that the glory of the stars, they're all different. And now, and we know that. But here, back in that time, I doubt if they had telescopes that could see very far, if they had anything at all. Um, so anyway, those are interesting points that it's talking about. But here we find these records, you know, that we have in the scriptures that are thousands of years talking about stars and the astronomy and there's and it's correct. The Bible describes the precision of movement in the universe. Turn back over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 35 to 36. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So we have this describing the precision of, of the movement of the universe in Jeremiah. The Bible also describes the suspension of the earth in space and its shape. Turn over to Job. Twenty-six, seven through ten. He stretches out the north over the empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds. Yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. He drew a circle horizon on the face of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. The pillars of the heaven tremble and are astonished at his rebuke. He stirs up the sea with his power, and by his understanding he breaks up the storm. And then over in Proverbs 8.27. When he prepared the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. So we're going to talk more about the um, earth shape here. I'm actually in letter, we're in letter B right now, but in section G, we're going to get more into the shape because I have some other information about that. But so we have the um, Bible describing, you know, accurately the suspension of the earth in space and the shape of the earth. So we have that. Statements consistent with meteorology. Turn over to Ecclesiastes 1, verse 6. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. The Bible also includes some principles on fluid dynamics. Turn back to Job. 28.25 To establish a weight for the wind and apportion the waters by measure. The fact that air has weight was proven scientifically about 300 years ago. And here we're reading about it in Job. Weights of air and water are needed to function the world's hydraulic cycle. Again, it's talked about in Job. Now science has proven those facts. Again, it's consistent. Uh, the Bible's consistent with science. Okay, section D, statements consistent with biology. Now we're getting somewhere. 
Turn over to Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it uh, to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is in the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So we know from this, the blood carries water and nourishment to every cell. The blood removes waste materials from the cells also. In 1616, William Harvey discovered the blood um, circulation is the key factor in physical life, confirming what the Bible had stated 3,000 years earlier. The Bible describes biogenesis, development of living organisms from other living organisms, and the stability of each kind of living organism. Turn over to Genesis 1. Eleven through twelve. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself. One of the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb yields seeding according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 21. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. In Genesis 1.25, And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Again, the phrase according to its kind occurs repeatedly. Talking about the how that uh, it goes forward, how these organisms produce the same organism. It's according to... It's kind. Each kind of plant, it's only after its kind. There's nothing that creates itself and it becomes something else. That's, that's why I was talking about the bird, Rich. I did studies on that, all those pictures that you see where there's a dinosaur and a bird and all that. It, it, it couldn't have survived, number one, because it, would be, it wouldn't be able to feed itself to either feed the bird portion of it or the dinosaur portion of it. And all those pictures that we've seen are proven to be just that. They don't have any evidence of those uh, creatures existing. That, just with the studies that I did on this project. What's that? Yeah, well, that's the other thing too. So some of the stuff we'll get into, just because we have similar DNA, like we have similar DNA with the eight, but that doesn't mean that God didn't create us different because if something works, why would you not, why would you make it different? And that's, we'll get into more of that uh, as far as the creation goes with different animals. Um, but yeah, if God, you know, the spine is a good example. It's something that's functional. So that would be something that, you know, that a lot of animals, people, everybody would have that because it's functional and it was continued to be used. Doesn't mean that we're of that species. <laughs> Lost my spot. Okay, so we we're talking about each kind. So the Bible describes also the chemical nature of the flesh. Turn over to Genesis 2. And we're all familiar with uh, this scripture, 2.7. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And then if you turn over to um, Genesis 3.19. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So I'm not talking about in five years, ten years, or whatever, but what happens to the, the body when it, when it if, if, if I died and just you guys put me out there in the yard, in a hundred years, what would be out there? Grass. Grass. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's, uh, that's the idea here. So um, we understand that that's how, when it's talking about this, uh, this, the chemical nature of the flesh. Um, it's proven fact that persons also have mental and spiritual health effects um, with physical health. The, the Bible also revealed this to us. Turn over to Proverbs.
Proverbs 12. So again, let me read that, just what we're talking about. It's a proven fact that a person's mental and spiritual health affects physical health, and the Bible revealed this to us. So Proverbs 12, 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like a rottenness in his bones. I'm not talking about, I'm not picking on wives now, guys. Just, okay. 14. That's not you either, Joy. 14.30. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. 1530. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report makes the bones healthy. 1624. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the bones. In 1722, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. So we have these um, evidences that it's consistent with mental health. The Bible even talked about mental health and it was correct in everything that it was talking about. So these are things that, you know, how finite the scriptures are. And I've read over these scriptures, I don't know how many times and never really put that together. Statements consistent with anthropology. So we have cave paintings and evidence that people inhabited caves today. So turn over to Job 30. And of course, this is after um, the people had escaped from Babel, 35 through 6. They were driven out from among men. They shouted at them as a thief. They had to live in the clefts of the valleys and caves of the earth and the rocks. So there's another example that there were people that lived in caves. Statements consistent with hydrology. The Bible includes reasonable, complete description of the hydraulic cycle. Turn over to Psalms 135. Verse 7. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning uh, for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Jeremiah 10, 13. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. In Job 36, 27 to 29. For he draws up drops of water, which distill as rain from the midst, which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. Indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of clouds, the thunder from his canopy? Look, he scatters his light upon it and covers the depth of the sea. So these verses describe the processes of evaporation, atmospheric circulation, condensation with electrical discharges, and precipitation. So all these verses just talked about that science and was correct in describing it. The Bible also describes the recirculation of water. Turn over to Ecclesiastes. One seven. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. Isaiah 55.10 For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. The Bible also refers to a surprising amount of water that can be held up or can be held as conden condensation in the clouds. Turn over to Job 26. 
verse 8. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. And then 37, 11. Also with moisture, he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds. So again, we're talking about, um, you see the dark clouds that go over and rain doesn't fall out of it. Here we have an example in scripture of those things taking uh, effect. Hydrothermal vents are described in two bit books written before 1400 BC, 3,000 years before their discovery by science. So over in Job 7:11, or I'm sorry, Genesis 7:11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And then Job 38, verse 16. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the depths? Again, so these... Um, 3,000 years before these things were discovered, the Bible talked about them in Genesis and Job, some 3,000 years uh, before they were discovered. Statements consistent with geology. So the Bible describes the earth's crust uh, along with a comment on astronomy over in Jeremiah. If you turn to Jeremiah 31... Thirty-seven. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Some scientists claim that they have now measured the universe, but interesting, um, they've seen the stars. I was talking about what Brian Cox had stated but interestingly, every time they've tried to drill through the earth, they've, any attempt that that's ever happened has always failed. Um, so they've never been able to uh, get through the earth. The earth shape, like I was talking about, I wanted to uh, discuss that. So turn over to Isaiah 40:22. I, I had this conversation that, um, well, it says the earth, it says that the earth is a circle. So what's a circle? I'm just asking, is this, is, it's a, I know you know what a circle is, but it, describe it to me. Huh? Sphere. Well, it, actually it's not. A sphere and a circle is different. A circle is actually flat. Right, that's correct. So that was brought up because all the scriptures we, we read about, I, I even went and tried to, was that the bell? Oh, i got to make this point. So... I don't have time to make the point. I don't. I got to read a bunch of stuff. So we'll we'll uh, next week we'll start there. <laughs>